Hi Philip, this is Mashnu. I've been looking at your game, the game that you sent me, and um, it's a very interesting game, absolutely. You played with white here against an opponent who was rated, uh, well, almost 200 points more than you. So, a very strong challenge to play against uh, such a strong player. And uh, you played a very good game, nice, creative chess trying to find attack on the king's side and a beautiful sacrifice at some point on, uh, on h6 um, so let's have a look at the game move by move you play d4 and your opponent played knight f6 c4 e6 and your knight f3 and b6 so we have the queen's indian defense and you choose for the most uh, popular line here to play g3 and then later bishop to g2 your opponent went here bishop to b7 it is of course a, a theoretical line more popular is, by the way, to play bishop to a6 here and to um, ask white the question how do you want to defend this uh, c4 pawn of course e6 is not really a good idea because after e6, yeah, the pawn is defended but this bishop, we want to bring it to g2 so the most common reply is to play b3 here and then black continues with bishop to b4 again asking white a question which piece do you want to play on d2 to place on d2 to stop this check if we place the um, the, uh, the bishop on d2 then well we would have we will have played the bishop on a square where we don't really want to have it we want to have this bishop on d2 on b2 I'm sorry on this uh, this diagonal towards the king side so this is let's say the 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 most common move here but your opponent played bishop to b7 also a good move bishop to g2 and now d5 a very logical idea castle king side bishop goes to e7 preparing to castle king side and here you play b3 with the idea of continuing with bishop to b2 your opponent castles you play bishop to b2 as planned and then knight b2 d7 of course black doesn't want to place a knight on c6 because he wants to keep the option open of playing c5 now knight b to d2 c5 as expected and you react calmly by playing e3 now here the first encounter happens when it takes on d4 your opponent plays c takes d4 so we have three possible ways to recapture with pawn with bishop with knight and you chose to take with the pawn here i can understand that this taking with pawn well it gives you this half open e file and it gives you also strong control over the square e5 but let's have a short look at the move knight takes d4 what I like about this knight takes e4 is that on one hand we keep this diagonal completely open now and after for example rook to c8, a very normal move for black, we could continue with queen to e2 the idea of queen to e2 would be to connect the rooks so later we can play one rook to d1, the other one to c1 and we will have these two rooks on this potential open files, the c file and the d file so this would be, let's say, a different approach to this um, to this position. But let's continue with your own game. You played e takes d4, e took on c4, and now you take back with the b pawn. So we have these two pawns on c4 and d4. This is something that we see in different uh, openings. This idea of what we call the hanging pawns the hanging pawns are these two pawns one beside the other in the center without any other pawn around it around them so these two pawns these hanging pawns on one hand they are a, they are a strength because they control these important central squares and also b5 on the other hand they m could become a target of attack if black tries to do this actually in most positions with uh, with hanging pawns with these two two pawns together the strategy for the opponent is to try to attack them to force them to advance at some point so then a weak pawn is left but um, it's not an easy thing to do and especially in this position where with white we already 
must uh, consider plans to advance this depot and open this beautiful diagonal towards the, uh, the king. Let's have a look how the game continued. Rook to c8, attacking the pawn on c4. It is defended by the knight, but you want to have the freedom of being able to move this knight eventually. So you play rook queen to b3, defending over protecting c4 so the knight can be used. Now here your opponent played a bit of strange move I find. He, he played knight f6 to e4 and in fact he's I find helping you a bit, little bit in getting rid of your own uh, worst placed piece that is this knight on d2. This is the only piece, if we, I'll go back one move, if we look at this position this is the the only piece that it's not really easy to do, to bring into play now. The other pieces have a function and the rooks can be brought into play easily. So by playing knight to e4 is actually offering you to trade your worst piece and that's what you did correctly of course. Take, take and now you played your rook from f1 to e1 attacking this bishop on e4 and after the bishop moves he went by the way all the way back to a8, you played here rook a to c1. And I'll go back just one move, like this. Because here with white, we need to ask ourselves, and I'm sure that you did this during the game, where do we want to have our rooks? Should one be on c1 and the other on d1? Or should the one be on e1, like it is now, and the other one on d1? So we can advance d5 and open the center with two rooks on these central files. It's not an easy decision. Um, a short look at the consequences of rook a to d1. This is not what was played in the game, but let's have a short look. If, for example, rook to e8 here, we could open the center. That's the idea behind these two rooks, of course, on d1 and e1, so we can play d5. And if black takes, we could retake with a pawn, and we have a pawn here that, again, the same, uh, both sides actually, like in I explained before with these hanging pawns, an isolated pawn can be a strength if we can advance in and use it for an attack. It can also be a weakness if it is a target. Um, here if bishop to f6 for example trying to neutralize this this b strong bishop on b2 we could play rook takes rook queen takes rook and then rook to e1 so with the tempo getting control over this e file and the queen would have to go back and now we could try to find an active place to bring our knight, knight to d4 would be good to, with the idea of perhaps advancing but also the idea of playing knight to f5 and eventually after trading here perhaps we have something something on e7, rook to e7 and things like that also advancing this pawn by the way the idea is also to open this diagonal towards f7 those are some ideas and some possible continuations of this, uh, this move rook a to d1 it's a very rich position. There, is, there are many possible ways to, uh, to continue the game with white. You chose to play rook a to c1. And here your opponent replied with a very strange move. Knight to b8. It doesn't look good. It's too slow bringing this knight back to b8. Perhaps he wanted to play the knight to c6 to a6, I, th I think this idea was to play knight to c6, but it's just too slow. A better move would be here to play the knight to f6. That's uh, the most natural square for the knight where he controls these two center squares. Still white has a nice position. I think it's equal, perhaps just a little bit f uh, better for white because of this control of the center with the two pawns. Um, but in the game this knight to b8 is really strange you reacted by playing your rook from e1 to d1 well again this is a, a point where you need to choose which rook do you want to have on d1 you could also have played the c rook to 
to d1 with the idea of advancing d5 and opening the center using both rooks on the d and the e file. Uh, in the game you played a rook e to d1 and your opponent, uh, let me look at my annotations, yeah he played bishop to f6 here. Perhaps this was the idea why he didn't want to play knight to f6, he wanted to keep this square f6 for the bishop to neutralize your bishop on b2. He played knight to e5 here, blocking the um, the bishop here and offering a trade of the light square bishops. Now that's something that black wants to do. He takes, you take, and we need to be careful here. Actually, before moving a move like this, we need to take care of the question are these two squares weak or not? How dangerous is the weakness? Well, there is not really a way for black to enter into h3 or f3, so this doesn't lead to a, to a weakness. Um, here your opponent continued with rook to c7 and you went with your queen to b5 let's see queen to b5 queen to c8 he wants to clearly put more pressure on c4 so looking for ways to try to perhaps later trade on e5 and see he can if he can increase the pressure against c4 you moved here, knight from e5 to g4. A good move. A good move because you force black here to make a decision about this bishop on f6. Where does he want to, to place it? Allow this trade on f6 wouldn't be good for, for black, of course, so he needs to either go to e7 or allow the trade by playing knight to d7, but I don't think that that would be a good idea here to play. Let's have a short look. If we place knight to d7, allowing you to trade here, knight takes, well, you have still this strong bishop here, and it's not very clear, it's not very clear what to what side this is going to, to turn. Um, Perhaps we could try to look at some idea of advancing this pawn to d5 or perhaps advancing the a pawn to a4, a5 trade here so we can create a new weakness on this side. All different possibilities but uh, let's see your opponent play this bishop to e7. I find that a better idea for black. Uh, even if this knight is still very badly developed there badly placed, but keeping the dark square bishop I think is a good idea for him. Also prevents eventually c5. Now here you uh, played a very creative move. I, uh, I like this very much. That you simply sacrifice the pawn on c4 by playing queen to h5. So you sacrifice this pawn and your idea is to go for this kingside attack. You saw a a possible continuation with knight to h6 check um, sacrificing a piece and that was interesting he took on c4 and of course you cannot now play knight to h6 you prepared it very well by playing d5 here sacrificing a second pawn he took the sacrifice here and then you played knight to h6 well it's not really a sacrifice in the sense that you can retake but it's not no, you cannot retake. If you retake with the queen, then the, the knight hangs, and if you retake with the rook, then the rook on c1 hangs. So it is it is definitely a second pawn sacrifice, followed by knight to h6. This is so beautiful. This is really very good. Um, you have sacrificed two pawns and now a piece, and this knight on b8 is completely out of play. So there is no worry about sacrificing material now because all your pieces can be involved in the attack uh, easily with the, the knight as well and the, the rooks also perhaps can be used later. Um, he took the sacrifice and here you played queen to e5 threatening checkmate on g7 or h8 and your opponent made here actually a big mistake but it's very difficult, I must say, to find the correct defense here. 
there is a possible defense. But it's very, very difficult to find this type of defenses behind the board. What he did was to play f6 to, to uh, prevent this, um, this checkmate. But of course, you continue with queen takes d5 check, and then after that, you took on c4. So you win, you win back a rook for the sacrifice material, and your pieces are very active. And his, his king position, kingside position, the defense is, is completely ruined. So this leads to a one position for white. Let's have a short look at the correct defense. The idea is that after this check, you can take on c4. So if black wants to defend in this position, he should try to find a way to control the light squares e6 and d5. So this check after f6 is not possible. This can be achieved by the move d4. With d4 he blocks the checkmate and if white takes on d4 then he can give a check on c6. And after this check, if the king moves, he can prevent the checkmate first by attacking your queen and after the queen moves to e3 to defend c1, black has actually no problem any longer. He could even take here on c1, you retake and then move the queen away. And black has here is a piece up. This knight is going to be rerouted to c6 to bring to c6 influence in the center. So this would have been a good defense. Now it, in this variation it looks as if it's lost for white, but we don't need of course to take on d4. If you place here d4, so that's the defense. Playing d oops, I'm sorry. Playing d4. We don't need to take with the bishop on, on d4. We can first trade on c4. That's actually better. If the queen takes, now we could take on d4 with the rook attacking the queen. And if the queen moves, we move the rook away, attacking the queen again and threatening the checkmate. So here f6 must be played by black. And then we can take on e7. So still we have a good position with white. The material is almost equal but this ruined kingside is um, something to be worried about for, for black. So I like white's position here. So it is a very difficult way to very difficult to find this defense of d4 and also then after this if you would find it it would be quite important for white to really calculate what happens if I take on d4 immediately and what if I take with the rook on c4 and, and those type of, uh, of things. Now in the game your opponent uh, made the um, well I think the mistake that many many people would make and that is to play f6 here because we think very um, very easily that there is a threat of g mating on g7 and the only way to way to prevent is to play f6 so this is what happened and then after queen takes d5 king goes to h8 rook takes rook bishop to c5 rook to c to f4 attacking f6 one more time and after queen to c6 things become really easy because now he wants to trade queens and he's the exchange behind so this is actually hopeless now for black now you take on f6 and things are completely over now he um, trades on f6 and in this position i find that an opponent a player of his level should resign in this type of position unless it's a, such an important game that it really needs to find something not to lose it because sometimes in, in league uh, games of league competitions um, the team captain tells you continue playing continue playing until the end so sometimes perhaps this is what happens here that's the, perhaps that's the reason why he continued but the position is totally lost for uh, for black you continued it very correctly, placing the rook on the 7th rank and then after this check picking up the pawns here a4 first so you don't lose a2, knight to d3 now advancing the f-pawn 
bishop to b4, rook to b7, attacking the next weakness, and after knight to c5, a check here, and then taking on b6, he took on a4, and of course you don't take here the bishop at first a check to keep the rook safe, and here your opponent resigned. After this, you are going to take on b4. So I'm very happy with this. Um, the way you played this game is is really very strong. It's this important moment. Let me go there. Uh, let me see here. After bishop to e7, so knight to g4, bishop to e7. The move queen to h5 is really interesting. Really a good one. That's creative chess. That's um, understanding that dyna dynamism, dynamics and peace activity are more important than the value of one pawn and that um, actually means that you are understanding this type of uh, ideas and uh, if I look at your rating at the moment 1689 I think you played this uh, this game at a much higher level so it wouldn't surprise me it wouldn't surprise me at all that if you continue playing like this your rating is going to rise uh, quite some uh, a few hundred points more in uh, perhaps perhaps this season if you continue playing and uh, continue fighting like this all right i hope that you found this analysis and this commentary interesting um, you know what to do if you want to send me more games and i wish you all the best and uh, congratulations with this win and let's keep enjoying chess Alright, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time on YouTube. Bye.